Yo, 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 what's good, people? Welcome to the channel where we talk about music licensing, music production, and music business. If you love any of the previously mentioned, be sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date on all the latest content and hit that bell icon so you know exactly when that new content drops. Shout out to everybody in the stream, in the chat so far. Let me know where you guys are from. Let me know what you do. Shout out to Kim Durr in the building. I see you. You are now modded. Shout out to Kim, a another mod on the YouTube channel. Raymond or Ramon, what's good? Hope you're having a great day too Vine on the beat i see you man how's everything going for some reason my headphones is i can only hear one ear oh nope i just fixed it so what's good man i'm super excited today sharon productions i see you um because i have a guest i have another guest y'all know how we do we bring dope people on to share dope information to help you guys on your you know your, your music careers and music journeys um and help you understand the business more so you can keep more of the money and stay out of legal trouble um so i'm super excited because today and I, I mentioned this last week i have someone who has obviously mastered the whole sample clearance space I personally have a lot of questions, especially in regards to sync and because it's just, man, it's so many, it's so many different levels. So without further ado, I want to introduce Deborah Manis Gardner. What's good? Oh, AK, wait, I'm sorry. Deborah Manis Gardner, aka the queen of sample clearance. There we go. I had to, I had to put the <laughs> put the title in there. How you doing, Deborah? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Clint. No problem. Thanks for coming through. Um, so, listen, for those who don't know, Deborah has been in the sample clearance game since like 1990. She's worked with clients such as Eminem, Drake, Jay Z, a ton of others. Um, and, and, like, so tell the people, introduce yourself, tell them what you do, what you specialize in, let them know. Um, I'm Deborah Manis Gardner, also known as DMG, and I have been doing sample clearances since 1990. Um, was at another company, um, saw what was going on in the music community, was really excited about hip hop and rap, um, but saw that copyrights needed to be cleared. Nothing was established at that time. And so I was actually in the forefront of helping to establish how to do a sample clearance, which has evolved and changed, you know, and it's still evolving and changing. But that led into doing film, television, video games, because the people in the clearance world didn't really understand uh, samples and how it broke things up. That led into me handling all of Grand Theft Auto. I've been working with them since San Andreas, wow. worked with Lynn manuel and did Hamilton for Grand Rights. Um, working with Roblox and in the, the Web3 arena, doing Post Malone's concert, um, and then any other new technologies that come about. We're involved in handling a licensing out on behalf of Snoop for Death Row and um, Shug Publishing. So we're, our hands are in everything, yeah. um, but it all started with sample clearances, which is my love. Wow. So, wow. So you're, you're, you're in everything from even like the independent level all the way up to the major level from sync all the way to, you know, producers using a, a snippet of their song as a sample um, for, you know, newly released and, and produced music. Um, super dope. Um, so I guess uh, let's talk about what, what all goes into actually samp or clearing a sample, say, you know, as a producer, you know, I have a sample, I flipped a sample and you know, I turned it into a, a new song with with an artist. Like, what all goes into it? Because I don't think people really understand everything that goes into it and why it can kind of create some some friction when it comes to you know releasing a, a a single or album or something like that. You have to take into account when you're sampling someone else's copyright. It's almost as though they were in the studio recording it with you. So just like you have a song sheet when you're in the studio and you're working with people and everyone's saying, well, I get 25%, everyone gets 25%, there's four people, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, you work on the writers, you work on the publishing, you work on the splits. Now you've popped in a sample in the song. And then it's like the writers of the song you've sampled became writers of the new song and their publishing gets a piece of the publishing. And on the master side, it's the same thing. The label can't own a piece of the master new recording, but they can receive a portion of the revenue. So that's one mentality you have to think about. So it's important that you keep really good notes when you're in the studio to remember what you've sampled. I don't know how many times people are like, well, I don't know what the sample is or where I got the beat from. Right. Um, it's important to keep really good notes. We actually have sample forms that we send out to the client saying, you know, use this to guide you in helping you try to make that determination. 
once you've utilized a sample, we're going to start asking you questions. Did you re-sing lyrics or did you lift lyrics? Did you take the drum beat, the bass line? We have that conversation with you. What did you utilize from the pre-existing copyright? The more information we have, the easier it is for us to clear. Then our job is to research it, to find out who are the original writers, who are the publishers, how is it split? And who is the original label that owns something? When some people go online and they Google and they look, oh, I see it on YouTube and I see it's, you know, distributed through UMG. UMG might not be the company that owns the rights. So that our job is to dig in further and say, well, who actually owns these rights? Then on behalf of the producer or the label or the artist or whomever, we contact these copyright holders and we start negotiating a deal, you know, on your behalf. In the world of sample clearances, um, the publishers on behalf of the writers will ask to own a piece of the new copyright. They usually ask for um, a fee of some kind. And on the master side, the labels will ask for an advance recoupable against a percentage of PPD. Uh, They'll ask for a percentage of artist net receipts for third party income like streaming. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they also establish that percentage or value for any sync or other future uses. Um, and so it's our job, not, not for you to have to learn how to do all this stuff. We do all of this for you, but we want to make sure that you're educated and you understand how this is done. Got you. So you mentioned, you know, you are researching like, you know, what or asking what part of the song did you sample? Like, how did you sample it? Does that play a role into the fee that's negotiated? Like if you just use the bass line or the drum beat versus like the whole part, does that play a, a huge role? We use that when we're negotiating. So if you used a bass line, but then you only rapped on top of it and all the only element in the song is a bass line and rap, that bass line has a greater value than if you use a bass line, but then you've also added guitar, lyrics, uh, horn, you know, you have to look at all the different elements and that would change the value. A bass line with just lyrics has value A. Mm -hmm. A bass line with guitar, horns, vocals has a value B. And so we ask for as much information as possible so that we can negotiate um, on our client's behalf. It also helps the sampled copyright holder to give them as much information as possible. Yeah. Okay. Got you. And then like how long, and I'm I'm sure it could be all over the place, but like how long is the process to actually go through that entire thing to, to get it cleared? It can range. You know, I once did a sample clearance within two hours and I've done a sample clearance that took a year. So it really depends on who the copyright holder is, um, what approvals are needed. You know, I did um, this survey a couple of, oh gosh, I guess it's been about five or six years where I said, what's the percentage of people that you need to go out to for consent versus what you can give a quote? On the label side, it's, a, it's about a 50-50 split. 50% of the time, the label can just give a quote without getting a third party consent. And the other part, they have to go to another consent approval party, whether it's a, 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 another label. You know, like if you're going to Rhino, they might need to go to Atlantic or Electra, mm-hmm. or uh, if they need to go to artist management for consent. On the publishing side, depending on the catalog, there's more of a higher chance that they need to go out and get a writer approval before giving a quote. So it can take longer. Okay. So, so that timeline is all over the place. Got you. Fanatic Productions has a question. He says, what about sync for films, a cover versus the actual song? <clears throat> okay. So, you know, covers and adaptations are getting really big again these days, translations, mashups. If you do a straight cover of a song, you don't need to get permission. Okay. Okay. If you do a cover of a song and then it's being used in a film or synchronization, you have to let the publisher know this isn't the original recording. It's like um, you've done a cover version of an Ariana Grande song and Ariana Grande is a writer of that song. She might say, I need to hear it to make sure I even like the cover or I'm going to deny the publishing. So you always have to be honest and let people know what you're doing. Okay. So, okay. So in the beginning you said, you don't have to let the publisher know you're doing a cover song, but you let the artist know. Is that is that how it works? If you well, you know, if you're doing if you're if it's for film use, okay. If you if it's a film use and you re-recorded someone else's song, okay. you're only having to get permission from the publisher. Okay. But you have to tell the publisher it's a re-record. They're going to want to know that. Okay. So okay. you know when I when I send requests out, 
to the publisher. It's usually, you know, song title written by published by, mm -hmm. and then they're going to come back to me and say, it, whose version, whose recording are you using? Okay. And then, but that's if, in the world of film. Yeah. So I guess kind of staying in that lane, as far as film is concerned, is, is, does it make it more complicated? Like if it's not a cover and, you know, say as an independent producer, you know, not tied to a major publisher, if I sample a song or have a sample in my new song that a, a major publisher controls a percentage of, and I'm trying to get that synced in, in TV and film, does that complicate that process? It's, it's multiple steps. So okay. if you've created a song that has a sample, you have to get permission for the sample first. Okay. And then once those splits are determined and you clear the sample, then it can be placed in a film, TV, or synchronization purposes, which then requires a secondary approval and secondary fee. Okay. Got you. Okay. Good question, question Fanatic. Um, yeah. So the, it's, it's crazy because, you know, I, I know as, as a composer for TV and film, that's kind of like what I specialize in. Um, I personally usually stay away from samples just to, you know, working with libraries, music libraries and licensing companies. It just makes the process easier. Um, but I know that there are records out there that have samples and especially from the major artists where, you know, they get them placed in TV and film, but I'm sure there's like a, you know, the, the process to, to get it cleared and things like that. Um, so that's interesting. Um, do, do you think there, when it comes to indie clearances versus major, do you think there's a different level of like complication when it comes to clearing stuff? I try not to make it a different level because someone who is maybe an, you know, an unknown artist at the time could mm -hmm. become a hit. We worked with IDK before he was signed to Warner Brothers and before he really blew up as a recording artist. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest difference is usually independent artists don't have as much of a budget or funding to pay for these sample fees. Mm. So, you know, when someone first approaches us, we immediately send them a letter saying, these are DMG fees, which are on our website, and these are your standard sample fees. So mm. this is what you need to anticipate in your budget. If they say, we don't have that kind of money, and we'll say, well, you should look at TrackLib because TrackLib has pre-existing recordings and the deals are right there again in black and white it's like fifty dollars to fifteen hundred dollars it's more economical for unsigned artists and gives them the license and the rights right away yeah this is where we're working with people but when we go to sony warner chapel universal and we advise them this is you know obviously an unsigned artist or an independent release or you know boutique distribution um they do take that into account but it doesn't mean it's going to get denied because it could be a hit so yeah. there's respect given Got you. Got you. So you work with um, with independent producers and artists as well as major artists. We work with everybody. Um, the most important thing is that we educate and make sure that people understand that if you utilize someone else's copyright, you need to get permission. You need to secure the rights and you need to clear it properly. Nice. Dope. Fanatic with another question says, who should a filmmaker approach to clear a song for distribution versus, versus festivals or for festivals? Right. So when, so you're, you're putting your um, attention towards sync. So let's talk about that. When we're clearing um, songs for synchronization purposes for a film, if you will, um, sometimes the client just wants festival rights. So we just go out for festival rights um, just so they can, you know, at least get it in the festivals and maybe pick up distribution. What we like to do sometimes is to tell the client, Let's get a quote for festival rights, but let's get an option for broader rights so that if you do get picked up for distribution, you already have your numbers in place for you to do your negotiations. Festival rights really went up during COVID because the way festivals were attended, it wasn't like people were going to private screenings at a festival. It was more online. I find that those prices have really gone up. Yeah. So a song used in a festival ranges between $500 to $1,000 per side. I try to keep it at that $500, so it's 1000 all in. Gotcha. Then, like I said, we'll try to get an option, which will say, can we get a quote for all media um, worldwide in perpetuity, excluding theatrical? That'll give people the ability to shop their film projects to the Amazons, the Netflix, the Hulus, the streaming platforms, if you will. Okay. Then sometimes we'll say, can we get an option for one week um, in theaters for Oscar consideration? 
so that and, and so you just you're doing all these different levels so in your request letter as the clearance agent i try to make sure that my client can take this end product pick up distribution and be able to exploit it and get the acknowledgement they're looking for for um awards gotcha nice and then we got another one from johnny blue says is using recordings from companies such as splice is that treated the same way as regular samples are treated you know, um, I got plus and minuses for Splice. Um, I know they try really hard um, to be um, uh, to take the position that when you sample from their libraries, um, you're covered, but that no additional rights are needed. There have been incidences where mistakes have happened and they didn't have the rights or someone uploaded or they didn't catch something. Yeah. Um, and so my major label clients are a little bit more careful and have, you know, um, they have to be a little bit more careful. So just be, you know, if you, if you're using something from splice, just really make sure that it's something that is not, um, royalty bearing. Um, and I, there's a lot of libraries that I'm very, very hesitant about, but then, you know, a lot of people took their libraries and put it into track lib so that they knew it was going to be a safe environment of material that does not contain samples that you can utilize. Gotcha. Yeah, um, Splice is always, it, I stay away from it because it's, it's tricky in the sync space too. Um, it, it's even gotten to the point where some of the, like the publishers I work with, they'll have you sign an agree, like they added something to their, you know, their publishing agreements to where it's like, you have to sign and say, I used like all original music, nothing from sites like Splice and things like that, just to, you know, right. to make their, their process a little easier. Um, so yeah, we got one from Raymond says, so with Splice Melody Loops, I I have here it have create some trouble when trying to clear them. So oh, we just we just talked about that. Yeah, um, I mean, because you're not clearing Splice, you know, you're not going to go to a clearance agent and say, I've used something from Splice, can you clear it? Because there's nothing to clear. Gotcha. We're just saying on our side, you Clint and I are saying, just be careful when you're when you're sampling from some sites. Um, Sometimes you're you're good and sometimes you're not. We're, yeah. we're just saying to just be careful. We're we're not saying don't do it. Just just be careful. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I see. Um, I see a few questions like sync, more sync related questions. Um, I'm gonna just pause on those for for this one because we just really want to focus on the whole the whole clearance and, and sample aspect since we got Deborah on there. Um, but so you also have speaking of sync you also have experience being a, mu a music supervisor um i know one of the works was the defiant ones um the documentary so like what what is that experience like and you know how did that tie into what you were already doing as far as you know clearing samples and things like that that was the most amazing experience and it it took place over several years uh, okay. working with alan hughes and dr dre and jimmy Iveen and you know, my specialty in documentaries really is stuff that um, has a time period of music that you have to use specific music in the documentary because it is what's telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that is my specialty. Um, but I did just finish music supervising um, a documentary, Dion Warwick, which just got picked up um, by CNN and is and that took several years. And then I music supervised um, the movie Spinning Gold, which is the story of Casablanca Records. And I worked with um, um, Evan Bogart, his brother, Tim um, was a director of it. It's the story of their father. Um, Harvey Mason worked on the score. So the role of the music supervisor, people kind of look at this as really glamorous thing. It's not just the music supervisor that's picking music and making all the decision. It is a joint effort, no matter if it's television, if it's film, if it's documentary, you are working together as a group of people making decisions to decide what music works best mm -hmm. and then to make sure that you get, are able to secure those rights. So I only music supervise maybe one project a year, if that. Okay. My love is clearing music. So I actually work with a lot of music supervisors because I love to secure the rights of the music. Um, what I think might work in a scene, someone else might not agree. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, and we do a lot of documentaries. We did New York Point Gods. Uh, we did Katrina Babies. We've worked, um, and I have to like turn my head to look to the right. We have so many different projects. We worked on the clearances for um, a, an AV kind of experience of the Georgia O'Keeffe exhibit, which is in Vegas and, and Atlanta, and another one called Space. So, 
we're wearing many hats. Mm -hmm. So as a music supervisor, your, you know, it, the, your hat, your role is going to be defined by who you're working with and what they need from you mm -hmm. in that particular project. Nice. That's pretty cool. Like, I feel like that's super valuable to, you know, for, for a documentary or a film or anything to have someone as a music su supervisor who has that experience to clear samples. Cause if anything needs to be cleared, like you're, you're already the person to go to. That's dope. Um, so we got another one from a fanatic says, how does sampling audio from other media work, such as speech from a show or a live performance? That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Yeah. It is um, difficult, time consuming, and expensive. So let's talk about uh, sampling from a film. Wow. So if you're sampling an, an actor speaking from a film, you need to get permission from the film company, the studio. You need to get permission from the actor for the likeness of his voice. Hmm. And then they also do suggest or require that you should be getting clearances from the unions as well um legally that that you should be so it's it's difficult if you're talking about a speech which we hear all the time you hear you know either it's a president where we've heard you know kennedy i think um in living color or if you're hearing um you know malcolm x or martin luther king right. if it is like a president a politician that falls under the public domain but you need to get the speech or whatever spoken from the library of congress mm -hmm. so that you're not trespassing on someone else owning the rights to that so for example if a speech is made and you're taking it from a news outlet they own that master as well you need to get permission Okay. If you're using something by, you know, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, they were not politicians, although they were public speakers and the estates own the likeness of their voice. And mm -hmm. it does require consent. Wow. I didn't know that. That's that's interesting. This is also opening up another can of worms. So, you know, IG reels have been crazy and all these, you know, viral audios and things like that. How does that play a role? Because they're you know there and i've used them as well like recordings from tv shows and movies and um from songs and things like that like do we need to make sure we have permission to use that stuff like when we're kind of creating these these funny reels and things like that or is that legally is that kind of legally you should i mean clint you own the likeness of your voice just like you own the likeness of your image yeah so if someone uses you speaking from your podcast they need to get permission from you if you don't own your podcast and you have a distributor that owns your podcast you would also need to get their permission so when you're utilizing stuff or you see people always say well so and so used it right. and I say well it doesn't mean it was cleared <laughs> right. just because someone uses something doesn't mean they secured the rights properly wow so Man, so is it just it's like millions of people on IG doing real like are we just all illegally using these audios that are trending on, <laughs> on IG? I have to change my content and, strategy. <laughs> I mean, you, you just you have to you have to look at who it is and where it came from oh, and to make that there is stuff that is, you know, public domain, but public yeah. domain even is tricky tricky terminology because something that's public domain in the United States might not be public domain outside the United States. Yeah. Um, a great example is the song Hello My Baby, which is PD in the US, but controlled by Warner Chapel X US. Gotcha. Wow. That's that's crazy. Like this this is a huge space. It's bigger than it's bigger than I thought. Like it just gets like when you start talking about intellectual property, it's just like, man, it it really has you it, it really has you thinking about just everything that's yeah, like who owns it. Um that's crazy. So is there like, you know, I, you hear people talk about, well, if you only use like a certain amount or length of a track, you don't have to get rights or anything. And I feel like it's a myth. Like, can you talk about that so that everybody here has an understanding of, of how that works or if it's even a thing? I mean, the needle drop myth. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Okay. So if you lift any portion of a master recording, you need to clear it because you are taking it. It's like if you steal a piece of bubble gum or you steal a fur, steal a fur coat, mm. both is theft. It's just one is bubble gum and one is a fur coat, but it's yeah. still theft. Okay. So if you lift, 
you know, and a, a needle drop worth of a master recording versus using the entire baseline, you have to clear both uses. The only time we have discussions and questions is on the publishing side or an interpolation. If you replay a drum beat, there is the argument that you can't copyright a drum beat and therefore if you replay it, you don't need to clear it. There have been copyright holders that have argued and tried to fight that in court. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea is that if you play, replay a drum beat, then, it, then you don't need to clear it. If you re-say spoken words, then we have to look as their prior art to determine is it copyrightable or is it not? And you know, Dr. Farrar is one of the best in the industry who we usually send stuff to with those kind of questions. Yeah. You know, you look at the stuff that Hamilton did, you know, for the play, and he wanted to clear these lyrical lines that were resung, as small as some of them were, because it was an homage, and he wanted to to respect and give proper credit to those songs. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. So um, this is another thing, and it's, it's so annoying to me. You see it all the time. People on most, I always see it on Facebook for whatever reason. The Facebook people, they'll have a song playing in the background and they'll type this little disclaimer that says, I do not own the rights to this music. Does that do anything for them? No, no, thank you. I mean, these sites have, um, they, they, they you know, like Facebook or Meta, you know. They, they have a great business legal affairs people where they went out and made sure that they secured the rights that were needed so stuff wasn't necessarily getting pulled down. Mm -hmm. There are parameters that are involved. The same mm -hmm. thing with, um, with Instagram. You know, as long as these blanket license get, are in place, then people are able to post stuff. If it gets pulled down, it might be used in such a way that the publisher or label didn't approve the use. During COVID, there was a lot of you know, pull downs because of the bots, you know, it wasn't human people, but there was algorithms that the bots were using and a lot of stuff was getting pulled down in error. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, let's see. We got a couple more questions. Um, Square Business Entertainment says he, uh, they were told if you do a cover without clearing anything and it blows up, most artist labels would actually not be upset and would likely work a deal with the cover artist. True or urban myth? Well, like I said, if you do a cover of a song under U.S. copyright law, you don't need to get permission. You just do a straight mechanical license and you pay for those sales. And um, if it then is being used in a film or you know, a synchronization purposes, mm -hmm. you do need to get permission. And that's what makes it different. Okay. Outside the United States, for example, in the UK, writers actually have the right to decline cover versions. Enya is known for not approving cover versions. Wow. And under the copyright laws in the e in the UK, she has the right to, to decline those kind of uses. Wow. Um, so and then you have to make sure is it a true cover? You know, sometimes people change lyrics and they're like, well, I only change a few words. Well, if you change a few words, it's not a cover. It's an adaptation. And then the publisher can demand that you get permission. Wow. That's dope. I didn't know that about um, other countries. That's crazy. Uh, we got another good one from Raymond. It says, what are some vital skills every music supervisor or aspiring music supervisor should acquire before or during his or her career? I think before you become a music supervisor, you need to know how to do music clearances. I feel really strongly about that. You need to have a good understanding of what those numbers are, what mm. what the timeline looks like, what it entails. Yeah. Um, because if you don't have a good feeling or understanding of that, then I don't think you can do a good job as a music supervisor. Being a music supervisor isn't just picking, picking great songs that you think gives you the right emotional feel to a scene. There's a lot involved to it. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense. Uh, I mean, like I said, like if I was if I was producing a film or TV show, I would want someone on the team who, you know, who was familiar with that because you're going to have to deal with it at, at, at some point, I'm sure. Um, so we got one from Lurch for you. The interesting question it says, can AI be used by big, big publishing companies to see if music has unclear samples, parts, etc.? AI software is able to soft, uh, separate most tracks into stems now. How do they deal with that? You know, AI has been around more than we really give it um, credit for. And so there have been people who actually created algorithms and AIs and 
and to go after sample clearances and to make claims on on behalf. Yeah. And we've actually been able to prove that the AO is wrong sometimes. Believe it or not, computers make mistakes and that, that, you know, because it's a human being that's programming it. So I don't think people are putting their energy creating AI is looking for and going after samples. There's there's a small percentage of people that do it and it's all about the money. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got who, who sampled, which I sometimes get very upset with because it doesn't necessarily have accurate information. It is people that are posting stuff saying, this song has a sample in it. I'm like, well, A, it could have been cleared. And, it, and by you posting it, you're not actually showing if it's been cleared or not. And B, there is wrong information. Sometimes people post something that's got a sound or, or something to it that could have actually come from something else. Mm. So let's look at AI. AI is not always accurate. Yeah. Yep. Um Man, that, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of stuff's created by humans and we're not perfect, so it's, it tends to not be 100% all the time. Um, what was, um, oh, so in with a service like this, you know, clearing samples, how does, I guess, how does pricing work? Is it kind of like an attorney where, you know, you pay like an hourly rate? Is it based on you know the the amount of work required to to sample it like how does that work because i know you know the the publishers and things they may want their fees like you had mentioned before or you know some type of uh some type of advance or something like that like how does how does that work so my fees are actually listed on my website nice. i'm that transparent and it's a flat fee and okay. the way i broke it up is i call it stage one and stage two Stage okay. one is where we research the copyright, send out the letters of request, and negotiate fees on our client's behalf. Okay. We charge $350 for the publishing side and $350 for the master. Again, it's all split up because if it's just, if you replayed it, it's an interpolation. Mm -hmm. My stage one fee is $350. If you've lifted the sample, it's $350 for publishing, $350 for master. I do not charge for multiple publishers. I do not charge for multiple labels. I don't oh, wow. have the bandwidth or care. It's yeah. a flat rate. Nice. Stage two is we get the quote and you and you're like, okay, I'm going to use the sample. We need to wrap up the deal. So stage two is confirming the deal, getting the label copy together, getting the splits together, confirming everything, requesting a license and making sure everyone gets paid with invoices and W9s. Same fee, yeah. 350 for publishing, 350 for master. I do not charge for multiple companies. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, these days we have songs with 12 publishers. That would yeah. be astronomical for someone to clear it. Exactly. As for the sample fees, there's an equation that we pretty much know. Most publishers charge $2,500 fee plus a piece of the copyright. Okay. If there are five publishers, it's 2,500 times five. Wow. When I worked with Megan the Stallion, we had a song that had like eight publishers and we got everyone to come down to like 1,500. Yes, Megan could approve it, but I didn't want, I don't like to set a precedence of, that much money being spent do you know what i mean yeah on the master side those fees which are advances are going to be based on how extensive the use is and that can range from as low as fifteen hundred dollar advance to as high as fifteen thousand i really try never to go higher than ten thousand if possible okay. and then they're going to get a percentage of ppd and and all the equations that we talked about earlier okay. so your but and, and so when people come to us we actually put together budgets you know from large artists to small artists we put together budgets of what we're looking at you know when we do brockhampton or what have you or logic we'll put numbers together to say you know we know you've got the budget but it's nice for you to see what these numbers are going to look like got you you mentioned you mentioned uh an acronym pbd what does that stand for okay so and terminology keeps changing Okay. So the percentage of, uh, you know, really is the, is the selling price, you know, Okay. but how are things sold? You know, we do these deals and not that many hard configurations are even sold. So it's usually a percentage of what the downloadable price is. Okay. And then artists are renegotiating their deals. It used to be, you know, everything came out of the artist share, but now the labels are handling it differently that uh, sometimes it's a percentage of gross or a percentage of net. What we did as a sample deal starting in the beginning of the 90s, which was we did buyouts, we did a penny rate, we had the uh, audacity to think that everyone used pennies across the world, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. Then they turn it into a royalty. So sample clearance deals are evolving based on what the artists have as their contracts. If you are an independent artist and you're self-released and you're the label, are you paying yourself? So 
how do we break that up? So we have to discuss that and evaluate how um, these deals are done um, and, lo- you know, and, and look at the whole picture. It's, it's unfortunately not simple as cut or dry because every artist has a different deal. Drake's deal is very different than other artists, if you think mm-hmm. about it. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, shout out to the new people joining the stream. If you guys are just joining, we're talking with Deborah Manis Gardner, the queen of sample clearances. Um, if you have a question, drop it in the chat and she'll be happy to answer it. Um, yeah. So what, what, this is, this is what I've always wondered as a producer, right? So if I produce a record, I have samples in it and I'm shopping that record to major artists and then say the major artist wants to cut that record release it and things like that and uh, as the producer am i responsible for getting that clear before it makes it to the artist or when it makes it to the artist or will the record label be responsible for you know hitting you up and then you know paying the fees associated with that you know, a lot of times the the label's going to take it, and then but you're going to take the hit as the producer. It's going to come out of your budget, or it's going to come out of your publishing, or come out of your royalty. Okay. But when you create a beat that's got a sample that doesn't have any vocals on it, it changes the value once you add vocals from from someone. And okay. so, a lot of times we tell people we could go out and try to clear a sample. Okay. Let's say again, let's use the example. It's a bass line, and then you create all these elements around the bass line, but you don't have any vocals or lyrics on top. Okay. That baseline has value A, but then as soon as you have someone singing on top of that or rapping, mm-hmm. the baseline's value has changed. Mm. Maybe they're singing the melody of the baseline, gives it a higher value. Maybe you know they've added all these other elements and it decreases the value. So if you are a producer and you've sampled a song, I think it's important for you to know who the copyright holder is. Is it available? Like let's say, oh man, I did this great beat, but it's Anita Baker. I'm going to say pull it out. It's not going to clear. She doesn't allow sampling. Wow. Or you're going to say, um, you know, I used, uh, I replayed the baseline of Love Hangover. I'm like, okay, that's, that's Joe Bet Sony. It's clearable. We've done it before. So you can't not, you, you cannot necessarily do the clearance, but you can gather the information so that when you do go to the label and they're interested for that to go for their artist to perform on top of it, you're like, this is the sample. This is what I used. I know what's involved. We've already spoken to DMG. And then as soon as the, the lyrics are put on top, then DMG can then run with it and take care of it. Nice. That's dope. So is is there like a quick and easy way to find out if a sample is clearable before you kind of get to the point of, of pitching it? You know, DMG, we do offer that service for $150. I mean, if okay. I know it off the top of my head, I tell people it's a problem or I've cleared it before. I don't charge a thing. If it's something I haven't cleared before and it requires research, we charge $150. But let's say you then hire me to clear that sample. I deduct the hundred fifty from the three hundred and fifty dollars. I see. So it's only so I'm not double dipping, you know, into that that fee. Yeah, that makes sense. So it seems like it's best to wait to, um, or I guess check with you first, and then once you figure out okay, it's cool to clear then kind of go to the next step and and have them finish the song and then present the finished product. Right. Um, and, and then see what all, you know, what all would be involved in getting everything cleared. Right. So like for $150, you then can have all that information from DMG that you're then going to submit to that label saying, well, we've spent $150. We know all this information. We know what's going to clear. We have a guesstimated budget. You just have to lay the vocals on top. Nice. Listen, I'm adding, adding Deborah to my contact. <laughs> so in case I need to clear something, I know who to call now. Um, that's awesome. So, um, Ahmad, what's good? This question is: Is it better to do a sample beat or to create your to create your and send it out, or create your own and send it out? Um, I'm guessing. I mean, I would say it's better to create your own beat than to sample a beat if you can. Although I love sampling. I mean, that's something that I have so much respect for producers who can sample. Yeah, me if too. If you think about it, you're taking a portion of a, of, a, of someone else's song. And you're incorporating it into a new song, giving it a whole new value and feeling and understanding. Yeah, that is a talent. That is a skill. I used to get so mad in the beginning when we when I started doing sample clearances. It's theft. People can't play musician. You know, uh, can't play instruments. Blah blah blah. That is such an amazing skill to yeah. be able to take elements of a different song, incorporate it, and give it a whole new meaning and value. Yeah. Conversely, you have to understand why some people deny their samples because when they wrote it, they envisioned it having 
a certain meaning, a certain feeling, and they don't want to change that. Mm -hmm. So you also have to respect people who say no. Yeah. Just like you, you know, get happy when people say yes. Yep. I agree. Like sampling is, you know, I'm a musician, right? So it's, it's easier for me to like play stuff and just create original stuff. But like when I sit down and like intentionally try to sample something, it takes me forever. It takes way too long. I'm like, yo, forget it. Like, give me a, just give me a piano. I'll figure it out. But um, yeah, it's an art, man. Like it's a skill to, to take something, chop that joint up and make it sound like something completely different and dope at the same time. So yeah, shout out to everybody who can effectively sample unlike myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, this is dope inf information. Um, and I feel like, I feel like it'll help a lot of people, especially producers, um, you know, who's just, you know, don't know the next step to take. Like once they created something dope and they're like, man, like I want to, I want to pitch it, see if an artist want it, but I don't know, like, what steps to take because it has it has a sample in it and the services that you offer i think is really dope it's straightforward um and it allows people to kind of move forward and you know make sure they're taking the right steps to you know to legally use other people's work and things like that um so yeah shout out to whiskey rock uh watches he says i don't play an instrument everything i create is sampled super dope um so yeah if you guys have any other questions definitely drop them um in the chat and we'll try and get to them um it, so is there i know the harry fox agency they have something i think it's called song file or something on their website like is that only for like mechanical licenses or is that something that you can use to like to clear a sample as well yeah you can't you can't clear a sample through harry fox like that okay. um you know what's, what's really sad is and as much as everyone has tried, you know, when you go to research stuff, you usually use ASCAP, you use BMI, you know, mm -hmm. use the MLC. Mm -hmm. But I've taught my whole staff, you have to go to the original publisher to know what the accurate writers and splits are. Mm -hmm. But even when you do that, so if you've got a song that is co-published between Warner Chapel, Sony, Universal, and BMG, mm -hmm. the only information you get from Warner Chapel for their writer and their split is accurate only for their information then you got to go to each publisher to confirm their writer, their share. No one shares information. Yeah. So you can pull up on your computer and look at information from four different publishers and get four different pieces of information, and you're just pulling what they control. Wow. Um, we're very fortunate at DMG. We actually are given access to the databases at these publishing companies, so we don't have to bother people. We're actually able to confirm writer publishing and splits mm. up front so that we have that information or and we can find out if we're missing two percent or one percent you know because you've got companies like hypnosis who have bought partial rights to songs so where a song once used to be 100 percent sony music they might only have 87.5 because hypnosis has bought a portion of that writer's share gotcha it's crazy it's it's really wow. crazy yeah and so harry fox is a little outdated and they don't necessarily have all that information got you that's crazy how like none of these companies communicate and we're all working together you know what i mean um so excello what's good his question is about track lib I, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier but it was like what about track lib for clearing samples sorry if this was already asked um but yeah you mentioned track lib versus like uh what do we talk about splice and things like that is that kind of yeah. the same deal it's not. I mean, what Tracklib has done is they have actually done contracts with publishers and labels who own copyrights. Hmm. So they have the right to put it up there and offer it to be sampled and you it's subscription based. And so when you go to, you know, you, you subscribe and you get a certain number of credits and, and what have you. And then when you go to sample it, the contract comes right up. Wow. And it tells you what, you know, because on track lib, it says, well, if you use this many seconds and it comes from this group, I think it's A, B or C, um, you know what that fee is. You know what the percentage is going to be on the publishing. You know what that percentage is going to be on the master side. It actually populates a contract once you put the information in and then you're walking away with a done deal. If you look at it carefully, some of the songs actually include synchronization rights. And if it does, they establish what that share is. So you've created the song, you've sampled it, you've done your license on Tracklib, and then someone heard the song and they're like, well, we want to use it in a movie mm -hmm. and we're going to offer you X amount. 
in that contract, if it's covered, they get, chocolate gets that X percent of that value. Wow. So it's great. So mm-hmm. They made it real easy to just use what you need to use and then boom, it's, right. you're good. But they don't have everything, <laughs> but they have a lot of stuff. I mean, Kendrick's used them. Cole has used them. Mm-hmm. Coward has used them. Um, Brockhampton, we just finished Brockhampton's album. We used some stuff. So um, everyone uses them. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, someone asked earlier, and I guess it's relevant because you're you're a music supervisor as well. But what's a, a way, or I guess your preferred way as a music supervisor for people to reach out to music supervisors if they have music um, that they feel like would fit for a project, or like what what's some some music supervisor reach out etiquette that you could share with the people. It's hard, you know, my, again, like I said, my stuff is documentary based. So, you know, like when we did New York Point Gods, we needed hip hop from the 90s. Mm -hmm. That was like, was relevant to our storyline. Yeah. You know, when I did Katrina Babies, everyone's like, oh, it's New Orleans. You, you want New Orleans bounce. We're like, actually, no, we weren't looking for that specific sound. They were specific, you know, we did use Frank Ocean, but I mean, um, you know, the young man who wrote the film had ideas in his mind as how he envisioned things. So me as a music supervisor, when people send me music, I take a listen to it. And then I have a file on my computer where I save stuff. So if something really triggers me, I'll make a note of it so that if I have another project, and it could be a year down the road, a month down the road, two years down the road, I can refer back to something and send it over to the client saying, hey, what do you think of this as a possibility? Remember, as a music supervisor, it's a team of people making the decision. It's not one person. Yeah, nice. That's that's awesome advice. Um, and it, man, I tell producers all the time, like, no matter what time period it is, you know what I'm saying? Like, hold on to that music because you never know, especially in TV and film, there's so many opportunities when you know people are cutting movies or they're set in certain time periods where that music becomes relevant again and you can you know revive it and monetize it through through sync so i'm glad you mentioned that you know using music from the 90s cuz i know it's a lot of producers out there where that that's like I know there's a producer who man this dude he like mastered the the 80s sound like 80s electronic pop stuff like it's just his lane right so i was just like yo like you're like one of those go-to guys for like when they're doing a film in the 80s or something like that and they need that electronic music it's it's there and it, and it sounds really good so that's dope um we got a q beats says i've heard that using synth horns brass makes a track not usable in sync someone was saying they need to sound real any truth in that um, I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that. Nah, me either. Like, I've the part of it sounding real or at least sounding authentic, I could understand because usually they, you know, it, you don't want it to sound super cheesy, like, you know, a brass on a, you know, a saxophone on a Casio keyboard would probably not sound that good versus a real sax player. But, you know, a lot of these sounds these days, native instruments, all of their horns, like I use their horns and stuff all the time and it sounds sounds great. Um, so, yeah, if it's if it's a synth, it's from a library, it's from it's not an actual horn. No, I mean, we use that stuff all the time in TV and film. Just make sure it sounds good. It'll be good to go. Um so that's awesome. Um, so listen, I know you're super busy. I don't want to hold you too long. Where can the people find you, find out about DMG and, and all the services that you offer? Right. So I have a website that actually has everything I said right on it, which is the www.dmgclearances.com. My email should be on there. Um, I don't answer phones all the time because I'm always on the phone or, you know, like just even being on this thing, my phone has gone off like 10 times. Yeah. But if you email me, I'm going to respond usually within 24 hours, unless you email me on a Saturday, there's going to be a delay. Um, and my email is Deborah D E B O R A H at DMG clearances.com. I do ask that you please not send the same email to every one of my employees on my website. We find that people do that sometimes and that just gets us angry. <laughs> so just yeah. pick one person. You can pick <laughs> we me. We work together, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Send me send me an email and you know, I'm gonna loop in people from my team if I feel as though, you know, we can get started on something right away. 
it's a boilerplate email that I send to people right away, which is, these are my fees. These are the sample fees. This is what you should anticipate. If it's a film project or sync, again, it's the same thing. It's a boilerplate letter. These are my fees, which are also my website. And this is what we need from you. You know, if you're doing a movie, make sure you put together a synopsis. You need to put a, an overall budget. You need to put together a music budget. You need to know what rights that you need. And that's what I'm going to talk people through. Okay. So, um, yeah, email me and I will respond. Check my website. It'll answer most of your questions. If you still have questions, we will answer that too, because knowledge is power. Indeed, it is. Thank you so much, Deborah. This was this was dope. Um, super insightful. Thank you for the information. And you're a huge resource for, you know, for the, the creative community. So thank you. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to talking with you soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having right. me, Clint. I really appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Shout out to everybody in the stream. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.